Matt Warren, I know that I mentioned literally just before I hit record that I would throw the baton over to you for a brief intro, but I find that sometimes the guests don't do themselves justice. So could you let me introduce you? Oh, of course, Gabe. Amazing. Yeah. I'm very excited to have you on. So thank you for joining us, Matt. For the audience, the Dark Mode crew, we have Matt Warren joining us today on the Dark Mode podcast. Matt is the director of the RMIT Center of Cybersecurity Research and Innovation and co-director of the Australian Lithuanian Cyber Research Network. Matt also holds cyber leadership roles in professional bodies such as the ACS, ASA, and the IFIP, and is a prolific and passionate researcher in cybersecurity. He's also authored and co-authored over 300 books, book chapters, journal papers, and conference papers. And Matt has worked with governments in advisory capacities, has also been a cybersecurity consultant for numerous international and Australian organizations. We're going to be in for a great episode. Matt, thanks for joining us. Excellent. My <laughs> absolute pleasure to be here. <laughs> so great. We've crossed paths in the now a few times, and I think some yeah. of the work that you've been doing, as I just mentioned, around a lot of the leadership capability, and particularly in academia, I'd really love to hear your insider views in terms of the work being conducted at RMIT and some of those sort of joint Australian-Lithuanian Research Centre. There's so oh, much to unpack there, but no, I'd love no, to no, hear it from your perspective. We're actually a new centre. We're Australia's newest cyber centre. We've just been in existence for two, about two and a half years. And I suppose what's very different about us is we're very applied um, in in focus, we, we, which again is what our, our MIT is, is about. You know, we're applied university, we solve real life problems. So it means we're not writing theoretical papers about things. We're actually trying to get in there with industry and governments and work out problems to solutions uh, and challenges. Also working with industry uh, is as well. So, so again, we're involved in a wide range of of projects with our partners. So we've been doing stuff for around, you know, from foreign interference for the university sector to cybersecurity in the mining sector. We're just finishing a project with the Australian Women in Security Network with ASD about sort of gender and uh, in, in in cyber and what that means for the workforce. So. What we're able to do at RMIT is really bring together sort of multidisciplinary researchers from across the university to look at particular problems. So I, I've just come back just a couple of weeks ago from Washington, D.C., and that project, for instance, was looking at how, at how the military use artificial intelligence, and it's comparing what Australia is doing with the U.S., with, with Japan. And really, that, that, that's really what I like is really the applied nature of research and also the fact that, you know, everything about cyber is global. We can't just think of cyber or what's going on in Australia. It, it really is. Everything is global. Everything is interconnected. And that's just not how it isn't just, you know, how government sits. It's also how adversaries see it, whether that's, you know, adversary countries, adversary Fed agents, you know, that they operate in a global situation and yeah, um, you know, governments, researchers, academics also have to think in that way as well. Yeah. I love it. I love the really applied nature of the research and very hands-on real world implications as well. I love that you use the term applied because there's power in having the data or a subset of data, but then operationalizing that so that it can be applied realistically yeah. there's such a difference between that and there's, it's not too often that the centers can actually join those two together so to apply that research from an operationalization perspective and just a data subset perspective so hats off to you oh no thank you and again it, it's great here at RMIT we have such a great sort of team around us as well which is one of the things that sort of attracted me to come into RMIT was all of those sort of applied skills and really that applied way of thinking because in academia that's not always the case it is very much or let's just write a paper and write some theoretical abstract and really in industry reads these papers and wonders well what, what are these people going on about so again really you know i i really wanted to move away from those sort of theoretical views to really that real life applied solving problems and that's what we've been doing here at rmit what are some of the responses been from business leaders or government entities, and I'm sure even in the academia space too, that you must work with every day, Matt, in terms of that real world application with some of this stuff? 
Well, it, it, again, certainly it's great. I suppose the biggest indication is the fact we're partnering with government, Commonwealth and state, as well as industry on, on, on so many different projects. So I think really, you know, that's, that's the proof of the pudding is that people are wanting to work with our centre, with our MIT, because they see the fact that we actually get results, we can land projects, we can deliver the outcomes that, that they're after. And the other thing that sort of drew me to RMIT was actually RMIT has an international profile. So our research center, we've got a hub in Vietnam. RMIT has three campuses in Vietnam. So we're working, you know, with the Vietnamese National Information Security Association, the Vietnamese Small Business Security Association, working with the problems that, that they're facing in Vietnam. We also have RMIT Europe in Barcelona that allows us to work on those European Union projects. And you mentioned at the start, my work with Lithuania and the Baltics really also brings that sort of European Union focus as well. Nice. I love it. So much good stuff there. I actually want to, this early in the podcast, I want to mention a few of your papers because I remember when we were doing the episode prep, Matt, I sent Ben, you know, kind of nerding out on through Google Scholar all your citations and everything. (laughs) We will link it in the show notes, but I just want to call out the top five citations and the papers there just for the audience, because I think that they're really interesting, not only from a security lens, but, you know, that truly global perspective. And then even just what I like to talk about often is just how we as humans are really interoperating with digital systems. And I think you've written a few really interesting papers that I believe the audience will find really insightful. So the first one is Understanding the use of social media by organizations for crisis communication. Very topical. Well, I'm sure we're going to have a host of discussion points around all of these. The second one, computer hacking and cyber terrorism, the real threats in the new millennium. Security for internet banking, a framework. Cyber attacks against supply chain management systems, a short note. And factors that influence the adoption of cloud computing, an empirical study of Australian SMEs. Where do you want to start, Ben? Which one oh. piques your interest the most? I don't know if anyone that's watching the YouTube or the actual video <laughs> of this, but I put on my glasses to seem smarter than I am for this episode based on some of those citations. Because of Just Google quickly, Scholar. Because of Google Scholar. Just quickly, <laughs> short note one wasn't quite a short note. That was, that's quite a long note. Ah, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no so, 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 sometimes academics love to write such long papers that, yeah, we have to call things short note. Clickbait. You guys use clickbait as <laughs> yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, can I just ask a question, noting that I don't have the biggest brain in this conversation. I'm sure the audience can attest to that one. But so how do you hypothesize the prior to entering into the project? I suppose it's interesting because with a number of those papers, some of them are written with my PhD students. So with the PhD students, what we do is we sit down and we look at a problem that industry is facing at that time. And then hypothesize what's the challenges that industry is facing. I think the, the other thing that I have to mention is actually the time scale of those papers, because I've been sort of publishing about, you know, cyber or, or as it was in the day, information security since the mid nineties. So it, the, the, those papers that you mentioned also cover, you know, part of that sort of extended sort of like period of security. In regards to that internet banking, it was really within at the time where banks were trying to implement internet banking security and not really understanding the technology at the time. From a user perspective, there was a lot of concern about your dealing with banks online. It was really trying to develop the, those uh, sorts of frameworks. The one about computer hacking, yeah, that, that, that was in turn of the century. So that was 1999. So th- that was actually us searching the net and actually finding that terrorist groups were using the internet and then monitoring their activities, building profiles. And really, that was the first study at the time, you know, that actually focused on the terrorist use of technology, how they were actually using it. So really, before those papers, there weren't any studies around terrorism. And what what was interesting is all of that te- technology is web 
based at the time because it was all just websites, turn of the century. But the way that they're using it or were using the website is actually the same way that those groups are using, you know, technology now in terms of being able to use it for propaganda, to engage with members, to radicalize individuals, to internally communicate. So many of the issues that we raise then are actually applicable today. It's just the technology has changed. So it's gone from like web to social media to now social, uh, you know, now sort of mobile and I suppose web free and cryptocurrencies, but it's still based on that sort of same premise that we find at the turn of the century. And what's interesting, as I said, is the technologies that, that those terrorist groups have used, all that they've done is adopted those technologies to fit their particular purposes. It's been sort of a quite an interesting journey to see that. And what was interesting in the 2000s, that the, the, there was no control of the internet. So literally you had terrorist groups having their own domain names or their own websites. You could email them and download information that, that there was simply n n n none of the controls and mechanisms that we have today. Yeah, I was even going to mention, um, because there's been a lot of talk even just in the last one to two years about software supply, and software supply chain management. And I even note that you've written a paper in the year 2000 on supply chain management systems. Yeah. So it's interesting, like, even though we look at the time scale and think there's this exponential effect, oftentimes with technology. But usually we've almost been kind of catching up to the threats and adapting to them and implementing new controls and frameworks, like you mentioned, Matt. So, yeah, interesting. And, it, it, and what's interesting was in the late sort of 90s, early 2000s, you, you were talking about, you know, the security problems and people just didn't get it. They didn't see it as a problem. And that's the difference I see now is people do understand what cyber is. They understand the human aspects. They you know, that there's a much greater awareness of it, which is, which is wonderful to see, but really in those sort of, you know, uh, at the turn of the century, li literally, you know, you talk to government of business and, and they would shrug their shoulders and wouldn't see any issues that you were literally spending all your, all of your time saying, Hey guys, this is actually a problem. What do, what do you think was the catalyst for people mm. in the shift in that mentality? Like if you observe so much at the turn of the century, almost sounded like probably oversimplifying a bit of an ignorance, but now people are really caring about it. I think what happened at the turn of the century was there was all this hype about the Y2K bug, the world was going to end come 30, New Year's Eve. I was literally just going to mention Y2K. I was like, <laughs> don't be that person, don't be that person. <laughs> simply, you know, uh, s simply because there'd been s so much mitigation, it, you know, it never happened. I think the only place it actually happened was a small country called Gambia in West Africa, where all the systems sort of f f fell over, but th they got a lot of help to restore it. And I think what happened, there was so much hype that when nothing happened, people turned off. And I think it, it took such a, a long time to actually re-engage business around that conversation. And I think as part of that is, is the fact that Rudy was always considered a technical risk. And it's only now when organizations see it as a business risk, it's now part of governance, it's now a board, that you see this dramatic change in how organizations view and deal with cyber. So I think that's, um, for me, a major change that's happened is that, I suppose, tra translation of security from being a technical risk to being a business risk and being widely accepted as a business risk. Yeah, nice. That's a great explanation. Ben, I know you want to jump in, but I just want to show my age here. And like, I really wasn't that aware at the Y2K bug <laughs> bonanza. But like, is it as simple as saying that people were freaking out just as clearly as that the date time format on systems weren't able to like turn themselves around as far enough to go from in 99 and two digits over then to 2000? And so therefore it revert back to zero and then have this big self implosion of technology. It, like, is it, that literally the overhyped? Yeah, it... yeah. And a lot of it was COBOL programs, but okay. the problem was COBOL, yeah. which that was too. developed in like the 60s, 70s. It was never thought that COBOL would be used, you know, yeah. uh, into in the... the future. But what happened was all of these, all of these systems were built around COBOL and yeah. So I've literally showed my age, haven't I? 
Yeah. I've gone and done it. I've really gone. I've really gone into us millennials. Jeez, I tell you what. I just roll oh, around on these cybersecurity podcasts, not even knowing Y2K. <laughs> but at, at the time, I, 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 people were that paranoid. I actually know people who literally sold their house, took all the money out of their bank and moved to the country and rented a house thinking the civilization was going to fail. Literally, the, there was, we talk about sort of disinformation, fake news yeah. now, but even then, there was such a sort of a paranoia in, in fear about what was going to happen. I mean, if we, if we, if that's a segue into human behavior, I don't know what is. <laughs> ben, 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 go on. <laughs> well, that was great. What's okay. What was the first is where for me, cybersecurity took the fear, uncertainty and doubt. That's the start of that era, right? And then we went from Y2K into everything about cybersecurity is fear related and we yep. are just going to freak the shit out of people until they buy a product essentially. And then we had a few consumer affecting hacks in the, the late 2000s, early 2010s that really brought home with a, hey, this could actually affect the every old mom and pop, let alone the kids in future generations, which slowly started again to turn that wheel. And within the last couple of years hit that point of there's actually business risk. There's actually a whole bunch behind it, financial implications that we need to be a little bit more pragmatic about cybersecurity and technology. But I remember Y2K and showing my age here as well with the grays in my beard. But um, <laughs> I remember my parents were freaked out about it. It was like, turn everything off. You know, yeah. we had this huge 2000 party welcoming in the New Year's and but everything was off. Every single device in the house is like ben, I the thought microwave, that was actually... the kettle. Yeah, just describing you before, was it? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you and your yeah, fam, yeah, totally. the Sully fam, off they yeah, go. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So the consumer lens is interesting because at that same time, like the late 2000s, was really the advent of that hyper-connectedness through social media. And yeah. so then I think you get mass communication and scale and more awareness about things, not only from that business context matters you were describing, yeah. from technical risk into business risk, but then you get a lot more heightened awareness from the general population around these sort of risks too, but it, information it, it, sharing. But yeah. it, it's also interesting because I, I think, you know, I suppose you went from like web one to web two, which was the social media sort of age. And what was interesting there, people didn't understand the importance of personal information. Literally they would share their, as they're doing now, is people are sharing their entire lives via social media. Or, and now it's through TikTok and other sort of online apps. And what, what sort of came out is that people, and it, it's still current now, is people still don't value their own personal information. And they're upset when a company's hacked and their information's taken, but they're freely sharing such unique information about them that if someone wanted to uniquely profile them, it doesn't take a lot to build up profiles about individuals and again that th th this is what attackers do with social engineering and use sort of social media whether it's all social media or professional social media to build those profiles and build those hooks into those sort of phishing type attack introductions yeah it was really for me yahoo the 2013 when it sort of hit home that it, it's not just fear uncertainty there was something like three billion accounts yeah. that got hacked in 2013 from Yahoo. And back then, Gabe, everyone used Yahoo. Like, yeah, it was the thing. I've never right? heard of her. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and, it, it, and it even used to be the search engines as well. These used it to be was. all search engines. Web that crawler. Never... That was yeah. the best. Web crawler was the best. Yeah. I'm going down memory lane now. But yeah. Yahoo got, got breached twice in 2013 and MySpace yeah. in the same year. So 2013 from Y2K to 2013 was that like yeah. malicious campaign to targeting fear for anyone around cyber. But, but what was interesting was that Yahoo was sold that year, but never told Varison that they were hacked. That's right. So they sold it. And then Varison brought this, brought the, the entire Yahoo sort of ecosystem, realized what had happened and then told everyone several years later, yeah. oh, actually this is what happened. It wasn't us. It was the previous owner. And I think, yeah, so it's, it's interesting now with mandatory breach notifications, you'd hope things like that would never, never happen, uh, happen again. But again, it's, it's very, much, very much a sort of a driver for, for why we do have some of those, I suppose, mechanisms in place now is because of those historical incidents. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I think we've veered I mean, off track here to a whole nother yeah. research project. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. yeah. I was going to make a joke about Yahoo and then into Google, like, you know, obviously the Google things, but 
we don't even Google things anymore. We chat GPT them. So that's right. <laughs> the, 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 big joke, the big joke <laughs> about Yahoo getting sold and then reporting it was that all the executives were ye yelling Yahoo on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> Classic, man. <laughs> hey, Matt, tell us a bit about the hybrid threat center. Okay, so what happened 2006, 2008 was uh, the Russians had a, uh, the first sort of cyber conflict with Estonia. But what happened in Estonia was there was a, a statue of a, a patriotic statue to the Red Army right in the middle of Tallinn in the, the capital. And the Estonian government literally just thought, okay, we're independent. We'd like to move the statue outside Tallinn to a park where we put all the Soviet era statues in a park. And there's a Russian minority, I think it's about 20% of Estonians of Russian descent, didn't think this was a very good idea and rioted in the streets about it. And then the Russian government got involved and uh, it was the Russian government, but not as we know it now, what it was the concept around cyber militias. So what you had were these patriotic hacking groups started taking down the Estonian websites, government systems uh, for a whole extended period of time. The whole country was under an extended denial of service attack, which meant none of the Estonian government systems worked and no one knew what to do about it because it had never happened before. And so simply they sort of disconnected Estonia from the internet. The May Day bank holiday sort of happened, which was sort of this sort of key Russian date, and things went back to normal. But what happened was that Estonia, a member of NATO, turned around in NATO and said, hey, this happened, and no one knew what to do about it. And NATO started thinking that this is an issue. And simply, I was curious. So what I did was, for years, I would go and visit the Baltic states, talk to people, go to Scandinavia, go to Eastern Europe, talk to people, find out what, what had happened, how things have developed. And really was spending a lot of time in Lithuania and met a great bunch of academics there that sort of fought the same way as, as, as I did about how the world was developing and what was happening with Russia and their sort of um, online uh, act, act, activities. And I started teaching in Lithuanian University, started speaking to their government and military about these issues. And what became very apparent was this sort of concept of hybrid threat. So in essence, what it is a mixture of physical, cyber, economic, political, threats against a country that's targeted. And again, it can come from like non-state actors, state actors. And really what it, what it did was give me a different way to look, to look at the world. And it, it's, it's something that the European, the Europeans and the Americans are very much sort of focused on is when they're now talking about state threat actors and the way that they work in terms of countries. It's the cyber attacks, it's the fake news, it's the disinformation, it's the economic. And all of a sudden, all of these factors are brought together to attack a particular country over a particular point. And it is something that they deal with on, on, on a regular basis. And I remember I was there for one trip and I was speaking to representatives from the Lithuanian military. And they said, Matt, we talk about these sort of hybrid attacks. <laughs> Have you ever, for instance, seen like a fake news site and how that turns into disinformation? I said, no, I haven't. And they actually sat me down. They took me to a website to say, well, this is where a story was posted. And they then tracked me through how journalists were picking up, how people on social media were picking up and reposting it and showing how amplification was involved in that fake news on one small website to the fact that it became a political issue that the Lithuanian and German governments got involved because the story was about German troops being, NATO troops being based in Lithuania linked to a sexual attack, which was completely false, linking it to what had happened in the Second World War. And it got to the stage 
where the German chancellor and the Lithuanian prime minister had to do a joint press statement to say this is completely false. And it was only afterwards, gee, that I realized how one story on a website can have so many political real life, real life ramifications. And I suppose, you know, in Australia, we don't understand this concept of hybrid threats. We never talk about it, even though we were actually dealing with it on, on a regular basis. And again, this was the idea behind the center was to draw upon the expertise of, of, of Lithuania to understand this problem. And Lithuanians are also very interested in Australia because of our role in Asia Pacific and the fact we have a large neighbor to the north of us who is also involved in many of these sort of hybrid situations. So it just seemed an ideal situation. And we had the Lithuanian foreigner, Gabrielis Landsberg, visiting Australia the week before the Ukrainian invasion. And he, um, on this first day, he came to RMIT to open up, uh, you know, the uh, research network that we have between Australia and, and Lithuania. Uh, because really, you know, as it, 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 he said at the time, he saw it as an example, you know, of how countries around the world that have a common value, you know, based around liberal democracy and sense of freedom, uh, you know, can actually, uh, you know, work together to deal with the challenges that, that are coming in the future. And really what we're seeing throughout this whole Ukraine situation is how the world now is changing, how the world now is forming into sort of blocks, geopolitical blocks, and how much of that sort of also relates to the cyber aspects, whether it's direct cyber attacks, whether it's disinformation, whether it's deception, manip manipulation sort of technique. So yeah, so I, I suppose that's, I suppose, rationale behind that. So I'm off to Lithuania again in a few weeks to carry on these sort of conversations. The Australian government's just op opened up a new through Austrade, a new trade commission office in, in Vilnius in Lithuania to promote trade between Australia and the Baltics and cyber very much is a key aspect of that exchange of information and potential future business as well. I've got two things and then Ben, I think you've got an excellent question prepared on this topic, but the first thing I want to ask is, do you guys think most people have that oh shit moment and choose to then focus their efforts in cyber? Like for example, Matt, you were describing almost that societal political axis there and how misinformation can really affect both lock steps and big changes in political outcomes. Because I personally had that having been serving in the military and then I was watching what was unfolding with Brexit. Mm. And we've had a previous guest in Susie Allegray, who's an international human rights lawyer. She's an author of a book called Freedom to Think, so Rights in the Digital Age. And what she also had that oh shit moment with Brexit, but there was also one in the US, which was Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. So like, I feel like there's almost these, again, catalysts where people have those big moments of like, wow, this information age is really, really affecting and swaying mentalities yeah. and public opinion towards really major and particularly political outcomes in the world. And I just think that's a really dangerous space to be playing in. It is. And it's interesting because I've sort of undertaken a couple of studies regarding fake news in Australia, and we've been very lucky in the fact that our elections haven't been manipulated. The closest we've come is actually the political parties trying to manipulate themselves with the sort of death tax stories in, in, in one of the elections. And I actually saw a paper about that dealing with it as if it was a fake news situation. But we've been very lucky with that. And where we have seen foreign interference in elections, it's been within certain non-English groups using Chinese-based systems such as WeChat to try to influence the voting of certain non-English groups within China. So we have seen it, but it's been very sort of focused. One of my sort of observations is because 
of Australia and our distance, certainly Russia doesn't have a particular interest in us the same way as they do with their neighbouring countries in the Baltics, in Scandinavia, in Eastern Europe. So we're lucky for, for, from that perspective, but they have tried influence campaigns around Australia that they've, they've undertaken activities around, for instance, our Bushmasters, our armoured fighting vehicles that we've supplied to the Ukrainians. And a lot of the sort of disinformation is how inferior they are in showing them being destroyed and, 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 and damaged. But again, it, it's been really in, in, ineffective. It's had no real impact. But the fact that you are seeing countries like Russia trying to undertake information operations campaigns against Australia certainly is something we've not seen before. A couple of things I want to add, Matt, and one that really hit home for me personally, and I don't know, probably did Gabe as well, being veterans, was trying to influence into the Brethren Report, which was talking about some potential war crimes that were conducted in Afghanistan. There was a Chinese government or a Chinese national that posted a doctored image on Twitter of an Australian soldier um, doing an act to a young member of the Afghani people. And it was a completely doctored image to spread disinformation. And it worked because it was picked up and run by Australian media like it was gospel. Uh, so there are some disinformation campaigns that, that truly do affect the language that people use about the, oh. the topics of, and that one really hit home for me. But the second one, talking about China, um, I've seen you talk before about what's in the South China Sea. And whilst we're talking about that, I want to get your opinion on the cyber inf implications of a conflict in the South China Sea, and uh, particularly some of the accusations that were in the latter half or made in the latter half of the last year by the Belgian government as it relates to the state-based actors in that region. I think certainly China does have capabilities. In terms of my work around supply chains, it was really looking at the, I suppose, the threats of cyber attacks on shipping and on ports. So again, I suppose linked to that earlier piece we we're talking about in, in terms of, of supply chains. And I suppose what I've done is abstract the supply chain away from the supply chain information system and then link it to assets such as the port infrastructure in shipping. And I think, you know, what you find that there's two issues is, is one, you find a lot of vulnerability in terms of IOT and SCADA systems when it comes to cyber and what would be the implication of them being exploited. The other issue, I suppose, from the critical infrastructure is, is, is actually our vulnerability and again, our geography doesn't help us from that perspective. When we talk about fuel reserves, for instance, as a country, is if our fuel supply was interrupted as a country, we would come to a standstill pretty quickly. And we've seen real life examples of that with the colonial pipe ransomware attacks in the US. So I suppose it, there's a lot of issues that we don't think about in regards to cyber is that crossover from cyber into critical infrastructure is simply when critical infrastructure fails or critical supply chains fails, it has pretty dramatic impacts on society quite quickly. And, you know, that's very much something uh, from the research that I've moved into from, I suppose, the technology more into that critical infrastructure space for that very reason. And certainly, yep, I certainly agree with you. China does have extensive cyber capabilities. Cyber China is developing into a global superpower. There's global cyber tensions between China and a whole number of other countries. And the example of the Belgian one is very sort of appropriate because, again, it's, it's linked to what happened in Lithuania because in Lithuania, they acknowledged that the Taiwanese government could open an embassy there. The next minute, uh, from a trade perspective, Taiwan doesn't exist in China. No Chinese companies can trade with Lithuania because no, Lithuania doesn't exist as a country from their perspective. So you then had a lot of political pressure put on Lithuania by China. A lot of that was sort of cyber influence. But because Lithuania's a member of NATO and European Union, it then brought in particularly the European Union, it brought in European Union members into, into that discussion because 
the issue is, you know, when you try to as a bully one member of the European NATO, you're actually doing it to the entire bloc. So I, I, it, it was interesting from that perspective that you actually saw the European Union for the first time take decisions as a bloc in how to deal with China. The same as we've now started to see that with the Ukraine as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. And the thing that piques my interest the most about cybersecurity is as a domain of technology very much links back to that global view and yeah. the fact that it does require cooperation. But most importantly, the fact that just like every single factor in life is integrated into the cyber conversation. Yeah. It's just so I, all encompassing. It so is. That's so true. Yeah. And for me, one of the most important things is cyber safety is the fact of what happens to individuals. And we're not talking about state fed actors. We're talking about people being bullied online or having their personal information shared by someone else without their, their approval in seeing the impact that can have upon individuals. Certainly when we talk so much about the good of technology, we also have to talk about actually technology can hurt people, can do harm. And what can we do to stop that? And we're very lucky in Australia to have the safety commission and the commissioner, the fact that they have the powers to take down content. There's, we have the online safety act. So, so certainly in Australia, that there really are areas we lead the world and cyber safety is certainly one, one of them. The fact that, you know, we're teaching about cyber safety at schools, children are starting to understand what online harm is, things they should or shouldn't do. And again, the approach Australia's taking really is unique. It's the, the first example around the world where it's completely embedded in the school system. And many countries are looking to Australia to learn f from our experience to see how they can protect their citizens. Isn't that so interesting? Just another example of Australia leading the way. Yeah. So are the Aussies. Like yeah, the can... <laughs> International Task Force for Combating Ransomware, Australia yeah. leads disruption as a work group. Yeah. Like countries look to us as we embark on leading cyber safety education for digital health with young children and those sort of hygiene measures. Like, go to Australia, we really punch way above our weight, hey? Yeah, we do. I can fully attest to that it's happening in schools. I tell a lot of stories on the podcast about my kids, Matt, and that they, my, they're 10 and 8 and they both learn about e-safety and yeah. cyber on, at school and it's fantastic. Some of the programs that they put in through, I've got to take my hat off to the Queensland education system. Whilst I, I didn't learn much maths in the Queensland education system, I can certainly attest to my kids learning a lot more than I did. But so now that I, I think now, that's you know, the I, operator, Ben. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, operator <laughs> problem. But so I put in, put in my email address on one of the streaming apps, the 5,000 apps that we pay for. The other day, and my daughter goes, "Oh, alert!" I said, "What?" <laughs> she goes, "That's personal information. Are you sure you should be sharing that?" <laughs> nice. That's, That's great. great. Yeah. Is that it though? Sad. Because it's every time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Alert. At least you, you've got crisis communication down pat. In the That's household. right. Yeah. <laughs> Step one. Yeah. <laughs> hey Matt, the I know you speak very much about the common themes throughout this podcast, but I have to ask your perspective from a future technologies context, what do you think AI is going to do to this entire domain? It's interesting because I wouldn't say chat GGP is AI at the moment. In essence, it's machine learning. It's the AI is the fact it's able to bring pieces of information together and link it as if it's a sort of a conversation. I think the area where things like chat GGP and the, the new version will do so well is around technology because all of a sudden you don't need to code artificial well, i think what you can see is that artificial intelligence systems in the near future will be able to generate code will be able to develop systems whether that's right or wrong it would speed up reduce reduced production costs i think one of the challenges certainly in in the cyberspace is around skills and whether ai is a way of solving some of those skill shortages so in terms of SOC systems with SOC analysts why would you need human SOC analysts when you know in the near future it's going to be automated there's going to be AI there's going to be linking to the SIEM system so I think certainly AI and technology has the potential to solve some of the skill shortages industries 
uh, facing. That also brings challenges because if you know the algorithms, potentially how to exploit it, if there's bias in the algorithms, for instance, but, but I think the skill shortage is, is going to become such an immense problem is that companies will be forced to do whatever they can to try to make that. So I, I certainly think you're going to see a wider rollout of AI into cyber. You also get then are going to see our adversaries using it in an offensive manner. So I think you're going to start to see a, a bit of a, 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 an arms race around technology. And I think at the moment, what we haven't seen is the offensive capability of AI technology being applied, whether that's to drones, whether it's to automated denial of service attacks at scale. I think there's a whole range of interesting situations we haven't yet faced, but we'll need to face in the future. So yeah, so I think the other big thing is quantum computing. The speed of transactions means that processing, that means most grouped attacks against password system and encryption will actually make them redundant in the future. So I think there's going to be challenges around that is all of the encryption approaches that we've been relying upon, how secure will they be being analyzed and reverse engineers by quantum systems? I think that's going to also be a, a big challenge. And I think it's going to be a big challenge because so much of cyber is based around encryption or hashed encryption or a whole variety of techniques. And if that's found to be exploitable, I think that could have a dramatic impact on trust and is going to increase potentially the level and severity of cyber incidences. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, Ben. Oh, oh, it's right down my then. rabbit hole at the moment, <laughs> Matt. You've just, this is episode two of Dark Mode with Matt Warren. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you got another four hours, Matt? <laughs> uh, just, just, I, I really, I totally agree with your point on quantum computing, Matt. I think we're at a pivotal point in history where we need to really look at our defenses that we currently have passwords for one. They oh. just won't hold up the test of time when we shift to full-time quantum computing. Um, at the moment, anything of four, five, or six characters, including symbols, numbers, whatever it is, could potentially be hacked, depending on your processing speed, in minutes to hours. Yeah. Anything up to 18 characters and beyond, it could potentially take months. But quantum computing, it doesn't matter how long your string is, that thing will, yeah. get, will get absolutely pwned within in seconds. So... We need to really take, take heed of that and look at what we need to change now, setting ourselves up for the future, inclusive of conversational ML, AI as it stands, quantum computing. These are the things that are going to bring a whole lot of changes towards us. And I think if we yeah. harness the power of them, we're going to be in a great state to, to, for our generation and the generations to come. But if we're lackadaisical about it, that's a big word, Gabe, write that one down. Um, Honestly, Ben, like you must, like you, you've gone next level. You've said at least three words in eight syllables on this episode. I know, it's hit a record, <laughs> absolute record today. But I just think if we don't harness that power now, and we're, we're going to be you know, lazy about it, then it's going to get to a point where we're just going to get absolutely destroyed by the, the opposite nature of it. And I think the problem is our adversaries are investing in this technology to a great extent that then than we are. So it actually then raises question for the West in terms of developing um, and investing in, in, in this research. I suppose bringing back to that geopolitical aspect, I suppose what AUKUS brings as an agreement isn't just about submarines, it's actually about technology transfer. And this is where the technology transfer around quantum, for instance, will help Australia, the UK and the US, you know, to get up to speed quickly and sort of try to catch up with where some other countries are ahead of, of ahead of the West. Everyone seems to focus on the submarines. I think that's, that's like the smallest detail in yeah. that AUKUS transaction. The bigger transactions yeah. are knowledge share and, yeah. uh, and the ability to leverage in relationships yeah. so for everyone looking at the dollar value and getting a freak out because there's only five submarines in 15 years or something. That is the smallest part of that AUKUS transaction. Yeah. Um, End of round. I'm still on quantum. <laughs> <laughs> when I first discovered quantum, just trying to make sense of it, I came up with that cat. I found that cat thought experiment. Which basically des describes like quantum mechanics at its simple terms, which is 
you know, how at a really minuscule, like subatomic level, properties interact with each other is like by definition of quantum. So it's like the cat thought experiment is the cat is both dead and alive at the same time until you look at it. And that's the essence of quantum yeah. and quantum mechanics, right? Because yeah. you're, it's just like next level. And then I think when you think about quantum technologies, it's the same sort of juxtaposition when you think about how AI is really transforming like human thinking and rationality and a the age of reason now. So we just have like these seismic shifts happening in just like our own human capabilities. In it, that, Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting about that human dimension. I suppose um, you know, when I get time, I sort of play around with the AI art systems. Mm. The fact that these the AI more or less can generate so many pictures and you think, well, what's going to be the future of artists? Because literally, yeah. and, and again, I think that these are sorts of s some of the issues and challenges from a society perspective that we'd have to consider is, is to what extent do we become so dependent on technology to actually, you know, lose the right of individualism and in human skills and abilities. We'll work out a brain machine interface yeah. and completely by thought, we'll be able to harness the value of these technologies for action. But for me, the other big area is actually space. Oh, this is episode it, three of Dark Mode. Yeah. Not <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, we're going to have our critical infrastructure in space. We're going to be processing data. In, in space, we're going we're gonna to have power projection through space, through our space infrastructure. I think that's also something that there is a lot of understanding of, is what that space revolution will mean for Australia as well. The urgency in all of this at the moment is actually getting people who can critically think about governing principles and like completely clean slate it and actually think of ways to proactively employ and govern and use these sort of advancements in technology because otherwise just like the advent of web two and social yeah. media and the information age there's so many unintended consequences yeah. so there's like a huge urgency and requirement for people to get together and actually talk about the transformation of human society and the implications of things like ai quantum space yeah and the like. dark mode working group dark mode working group sign up hey just to end matt i want to punch out as of i have one recommendation to wrap up the the episode i follow eric schmidt pretty religiously the former ceo and chairman of google he now does a lot of work in ai and as of the 20th of march as we record this podcast only five days ago he released a 16 minute video on youtube called the age of ai and our human future it's actually a book i started reading a couple of months ago so it's actually co-authored and the video is basically using generative AI to describe the storyline around the age of AI. And it's co-authored between Eric Schmidt, Henry Kissinger, and Daniel Huttenlocker. So you've got former secretary, you've got Eric Schmidt, technology yeah. business leader, and then you've got an ac academic. The three of them coming together to really actually build this governance and think really critically and do a lot of these thought experiments on how we actually... Um, recognize that transformation happening in the world and to humanity with these sort of advances and rapid advances of these technologies. Really interesting. I will link it in the show note. Excellent. And I'll definitely send it to you as well, Matt. Very, Thank very you. interesting. Thank you. I just loaded it up here. I'm going to watch that to this. <laughs> Amazing. 60 minutes, Ben. So if you watch it on two times speed, it'll only take you eight. Nah, I need to reduce it to 0. 0.5 for my brain game. 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5 in transcript. <laughs> Just study like this is bring it in. <laughs> hey, Matt, thank you so much for your perspectives and your time. That's oh. been a really thoughtful conversation. So appreciate it a lot. No, thank you, Gabe. Thanks, Ben. It's been amazing. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or leave us a rating on your favorite podcast platform. See you on the next episode of Dark Mode.